Welcome to Journey to S4 HANA, the podcast that covers everything related to SAP implementations. This podcast is not affiliated with SAP and covers the realistic truth behind S4 HANA, Ariba, and SuccessFactors ERP implementation success. Whether you're new to the world of SAP, an existing ECC, or R3 customer, a multinational team, or a mid-sized organization, this podcast is for you. Now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Welcome to episode number five of the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world with their S4 HANA implementations, as well as their non-SAP digital transformation journeys. This podcast covers everything you need to know about S4 HANA implementations. We cover the good, the bad, the ugly about S4 HANA implementations, the things you need to know, the lessons from customers, experts, consultants, analysts, etc. So our whole goal here is to educate you and just share some of the the lessons from the front lines of companies that have gone through S4 HANA implementations and also others that are working in the S4 HANA space. So thanks for being here today. Uh, the show is sponsored by Third Stage Consulting, which is my company I just mentioned, and it is uh, produced by Major Tom Productions. And if you'd like to learn more about sponsorship and partnership collaborations on this podcast to feature your brand or product or service to get it out to the SAP community or via the non-SAP community or the general tech community via some of our other podcasts, be sure to reach out to Mindy at Major Tom Productions. I've included her contact information below. So uh, uh, joining me as always, I almost forgot uh, the co-host today. We've got uh, Darian co-hosting as always. Darian, thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me and remembering, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. After, you know, on our fifth episode now, you'd think we'd have stuff figured out, but, you know, we're both still learning. When I say we, I mean, I'm still learning. I, I think you've got to figure it out better than I do, but we'll we'll uh, we'll roll with it anyway. I don't know about that. <laughs> Well, good. Well, we've got a great show today. I'm excited for our guest. Uh, he's someone I've known for a long time in the space. Uh, his name's John Reed. He's very well known. He writes for Diginomica, which, by the way, if you don't ever go to the website Diginomica, which is, by the way, spelled D-I-G-I-N-O-M-I-C-A, Diginomica. I think I spelled it right, but it's D-I-G is what you need to know at the beginning, uh, .com. Uh, great publication. They have a really unique way of writing that's matter of fact, it's objective, but it's also spicy at times. There's, they've got a lot of a lot of personality and sometimes even attitude in, in the way they write, which I really like. Uh, and it's it, that comes out uh, when I talk to John, too. He's, he's a great guy, knows a lot about the space. So we're going to have him on the show here in just a moment from a, sort of an analyst perspective that's been covering the space for a long time. Uh, we're going to talk about some of SAP's AI and innovation uh, initiatives and what that means to S4 HANA customers and what it means to your S4 HANA implementation. So be sure to stick around. We'll have him on the show here in just a moment. Uh, but before we jump into um, today's guest, just one last thing. You can find new episodes of the show and future episodes at journeytest4hana.com. So be sure to check out that website if you want to go view some of the episodes you might have missed and keep up with the new ones coming out as they come out. So before we bring John onto the show to talk about AI and innovation in S4HANA, um, you've got some sort of related topics, you, audience questions really from social media that you wanted to cover here, Darian. So what what are these social media questions we've received recently about s 4 hana Yeah, so the first one's kind of interesting and maybe something that we haven't maybe discussed before. And that's what are some common misconceptions or myths surrounding s 4 hana SAP in general that you often maybe hear? Hmm, that's a good question. I you know, I, I think uh, probably the biggest misconception I hear about S4HANA is that it is a totally advanced and mature product. Um, on one hand, it's true that S4HANA is bringing a bunch of brand new capabilities to the market that SAP customers didn't have access to before. Things like, uh, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence and some of the more advanced analytics and, um, you know, certainly the real time processing with the S4 or with the, uh, the HANA database and the HANA platform, which is that real time processing, which really speeds things up and gives you a lot of real time access that a lot of legacy SAP customers and non SAP customers don't have currently with their legacy systems. So that stuff is real. But then you flip and look at the other side, and there's a lot of capabilities that ECC and R3 had because it's they've been around for so long. And there's so much money that was been spent in R&D on those products. Some of those capabilities still haven't found their way over to S4 HANA. So it's kind of a weird um, dichotomy where on one hand, you've got all these advanced emerging technologies that are getting baked into S4 HANA. 
But then, for example, in manufacturing, there's some advanced planning capabilities that you could get out of ECC or R3 that you're not getting in S4 HANA necessarily. So we've had some clients that say, yeah, I, I mean, there's some good stuff in S4 HANA, but there's too much missing in the core S4 HANA product. Um, so, you know, we're going to hold off and wait till it matures further. Now, having said that, there's a ways around that. I mean, there's certainly, um, you know, you can still, if you want, you can do S4 HANA on-prem and do some customization if you need to, even though customization is a bad word and no one wants to do it. It is an option that comes with this risk, but you could do it. You can also look at success factors and Ariba and Concur and some of these third-party systems that SAP has acquired and kind of brought in under their umbrella. You could also look at other third parties that aren't SAP products and consider bringing those in to plug some of those gaps. So there's lots of ways around it, but probably the biggest misconception is S4 HANA is a complete product that's going to be just as good as ECC and R3. And in some cases, uh, clients also think that it's going to be just a sort of a lift and shift upgrade from their current system to S4 HANA, which that is also uh, not true as well. So those are those are a few that come to mind. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And also, another audience question that we received was, is SAP S4 HANA one of the most common failures that you get called in to do crisis management? Or do you see that kind of across the whole board with all other ERP systems? Well, I, I mean, we've seen all kinds of failures and troubled projects, distressed projects, uh, lawsuits that we've been expert witnesses in and for. Uh, but I would say SAP is the most common one. And I, and I don't think, though, to be fair, I don't think it's because SAP has more problems necessarily or S4 HANA or SAP products are more flawed than any other systems. I think it's more the nature of SAP customers. I mean, SAP, by definition, is a large, complex, robust solution that is meant and built for the world's largest organizations. And when the world's largest organizations fail in their efforts, you're going to hear about it. Um, they're going to end up in litigation because there's so much money at stake for these bigger companies. Whereas, you know, like a small or mid-sized company that didn't spend a ton of money on their implementation, but they have failed, it may not be worth it for them to go pursue anything legally. And you're not going to hear about it even if they did. So, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a, you know, high profile factor as far as SAP customers are usually pretty high profile or relatively high profile. You're going to read about it in the news when they fail, or you're going to, you're going to know about it because you're a customer of that, that company or whatever. Um, so I would say, no, I don't see necessarily a correlation between, um, failure rates and software vendor, um, SAP. You also have to remember SAP has the biggest market share of any of the other ERP vendors in the space. So by definition or, um, by logic, you're just going to have a higher number of failures too, because you've got more customers using it. So when you factor all those things in, I don't know that there's necessarily a correlation between SAP and failure rate. It's more big, complex company, big, complex transformation is more likely to lead to uh, failure. Yeah, those are some really good points. Uh, audience, if you guys want to ask more questions about SAP, if you have any more questions about S4 HANA, please comment them, leave them in the chat, and we will be sure to address them in our next few episodes. Moving on to today's article for the podcast today. So SAP announced a $2.2 billion restructuring program that will impact 8,000 jobs. SAP has announced that the 2 billion euro restructuring program for 2024, focusing on AI impacting 8,000 employees again, which is about 7.4% of its workforce to give you a perspective of that. The move aims to enhance operational efficiency and prepare for future growth with most affected positions expected to be covered by voluntary and leave, voluntary leave and reskilling programs, which is a good thing. Analysts believe that SAP will help adapt the AI advancements aligning with industry trends. So Eric, what are your thoughts on SAP's decision to implement a restructuring program fo focused on AI? Well, I, I think it's interesting and, and it maybe goes to show that there is going to be potentially some fallout from AI, certainly in the tech space to start, but maybe even other industries as, as the AI technology matures. So I think on one hand, it's, it's good that SAP is being smart. I mean, they, they, um, you know, they're, it's interesting because their, their stock price since that news broke a few weeks ago, um, that you just described that article broke a few weeks ago, their, uh, their stock price has been at or near an all time high. So investors clearly see something they really like in SAP. Maybe that's part of it is that they, they're taking action to 
you know, reduce efficiency and, or I'm sorry, reduce inefficiency and, and, uh, you know, become more lean, especially if AI enables some of that. And so it doesn't surprise me that tech companies are probably going to see more of that because now you don't need to do as much manual coding and AI can help you do some of the, the really technical stuff. It's not going to totally replace humans anytime soon, but it, it certainly will have an impact where you don't need as many, as many heads, you know, focused on some of that stuff. For sure. That makes sense. And what are your potential challenges or what are their potential challenges and opportunities for executing this program? Like what, what will they see from this beneficially? Well, I think, you know, certainly their stock price, as I mentioned, I think that's part of what they're seeing is the stock price is doing well since that news was announced. Um, I think they'll also obviously experience probably higher uh, profit margins, you know, their, their revenue is probably not going to drop because they've reduced staff. It's, it's, it sounds like it's more of a fixed cost that they're reducing. So that'll help. Um, be curious to see, you know, does it affect their innovation and their progress with, with, uh, with their S4 HANA rollouts and things of that nature? I know, you know, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, with all the upside potential of all these customers in the SAP customer base, that haven't yet even started an S4 on a migration, you know, I think it's about two thirds of them haven't even started to make the move from ECC or R3 over S4 HANA, you know, how uh, is that just going to create more of a, a tech talent shortage? The fact that they just eliminated 7% of their staff at a time when presumably the demand for tech talent is going to spike as more of these customers move over to S4 HANA. I don't know the answer to that, but that'd be a big question mark I'd have on that, that strategy. Yeah, and I want to circle back to maybe something else that you touched on that investors are seemingly happy with the stock price being high now and also um, just the AI integration that they have. Besides for SAP, what do you think for TrendsWise in the tech industry regarding AI integration and the workforce? What do you think that this big move that SAP initiated will maybe do for that? For the, the tech space in general? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it, you know, I think it'll, it'll make other companies, tech companies rethink their headcount and look at their efficiency and look at how AI could maybe make them more, more efficient and effective. But again, I keep coming back to this thought around the tech talent shortage. There's already a shortage of tech skills and there's already a mass influx of organizations that are trying to go through digital transformations right now, largely because of the cloud movement and the fact that SAP and other software vendors are, are sort of pushing or forcing customers onto cloud platforms. So it's creating this artificial demand for tech services and tech skills. So I, I don't know, I, I, uh, some tech companies might look at SAP and say, yeah, you know, we could be smarter about how we um, look at our headcount and use AI more effectively. And, or they might say, um, yeah, maybe we do look at AI, but we're going to free up capacity to handle this influx of demand that we're about to see. So I don't know. I, I can see it going either way, to be honest. For sure. And this conversation today that you're about to have is going to dive deeper into this, what we're currently talking about for SAP's AI innovation. So I'm yeah. excited to hear this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, John's got some great um, insights into what's going on internally within SAP. And, he, and I'm going to ask him some questions around not only their org structure and their new organization going forward, which you alluded to, Darian, in that article you, you cited, but also just some of their general AI and innovation strategies. So we're going to bring John Reed onto the show. John Reed is a uh, one of the founders and contributors at Diginomica, which is a great technology-related website. I highly recommend if you don't read it, go to diginomica.com. That's Diginomica with a G, sort of like digital, but Nomica instead of digital. Um, so be sure to check that out. But we're going to have John on the show here in a minute. He'll tell us more about Diginomica and some of the trends he's seeing in the AI and innovation uh, thread within S4 HANA. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more of episode number five of the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. People oftentimes ask me how I built such a strong social media following on YouTube and LinkedIn and Facebook and other outlets. And the fact of the matter is, is it took me a long time to build a following through a lot of trial and error, make a lot of mistakes. Had I known that there were companies out there that could help me build my brand, I would have done that a long time ago. I didn't know that, but the good news is that there is today a consulting firm that will help you through building your own personal brand through some of their training programs. 
the company is called Roloff Consulting. And if you're familiar with, with Emma Roloff, um, she's someone that I've had on this podcast before, and she's well known in the digital transformation space as well as the sales uh, space. And uh, she's big on TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And she and her husband have started a training course and a training company that focuses on helping people build their personal brands and helping them to sell themselves digitally. So whether you're a salesperson that's trying to reach more customers or you're an individual that's just trying to build your personal brand, uh, that's something that they help with through their training programs. And they've offered listeners of this podcast a free five-day LinkedIn challenge. And I encourage you to check it out. I've included a link below for this podcast. If you go to the podcast notes, you'll find a link that gets you free access to this five-day challenge where you'll get step-by-step -step guidance. Um, you'll get real results. So you'll get some tangible results from the program. And you also get a special offer at the end of it. So it's exclusive to listeners of this podcast. Be sure to check out the link below if you want to work on building your personal brand or if you're in sales and you're trying to reach more people. Whatever the case may be, check it out. Uh, it's free to listeners uh, of this podcast. You can check it out via the link below. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how you can take your transformation to the third stage of success. Welcome back to episode number five of the Journey Desk 4 HANA podcast. My name is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. Third Stage is not only the sponsor of this podcast, but also the uh, leading independent tech agnostic consulting firm that helps clients through their S4 HANA implementations, as well as their digital transformations that may or may not include SAP. So uh, be sure to learn more about us at thirdstage-consulting.com. The show is produced by Major Tom Productions. You can learn more about sponsorship and partnership opportunities on this podcast and other podcasts that Major Tom produces by reaching out to Mindy on the Major Tom Productions team. You can find her contact information in the description field below on this podcast. So excited for our guest today, John Reed from Diginomica. He's a contributor at that publication. He's been covering the SAP space for as long as I've known him. I think I've known him or of him at least for about 20 years now. And he's been doing this for even longer than that in the SAP and ERP space. So all that being said, John, welcome to the show. Yeah, good to be back with you, Eric. We always have fun conversations. Let's see what we can do today. We do. You're one of my favorite guests because A, you're unfiltered. B, it's just it's always an entertaining conversation. And C, probably most importantly, you you, you know so much about the SAP space and, and you've been tracking this for, for a long time. But maybe tell us a little bit about your history in the SAP ecosystem and um, how you grew up in the space. And also, while you're at it, if you don't mind, just tell us a little bit about Diginomica, what you're up to more recently. Yeah, I'll try to keep this really short because I want to get to our good questions. But um, yeah, I've been writing about SAP market since 1995, and that has evolved, worn a lot of different hats over the years, um, but always kind of keeping an eye on how this market is evolving. Um, when we started Diginomica a little more than 10 years ago, um, I was in the process of intentionally broadening my focus in a few different ways, trying to become more of a journalist analyst hybrid. I was really trying to find my own voice in the market that was that I that was a little more hopefully unique. I always tried, but I felt like this was the platform to do that. And I also did something that I think formed a stronger connection with with you that I think has been great, which is just really focused on transformation. Like what is the reality of that for customers? And I think you and I ultimately are both obsessed with that topic. And so that became important because I don't want to just track vendors. I want to track the essential core issues of people, process, technology, how it all fits, and look at that from a customer perspective first and foremost, and then look at vendor narratives and how vendors deliver on this or not. And SAP became one of a number of vendors that I track. But I think one thing that's a little bit unique about what I do in the SAP world is that I spent a lot of time in dialogue with user groups. So... A lot of the analysts that I that that know the SAP market really well don't do that as maybe as much as I do. A couple of them do, but a lot of them don't. But for me, that's a really interesting way of kind of bringing it all together. Um, anyway, um, that's what I do, and just try to look at SAP, but also look at a lot of what their competitors are doing and what upstarts are doing to try to get a balanced view of everything. 
Yeah, and I, I think, you know, what you do and what Diginomica does, the rest of you guys at Diginomica, what you do really well is you're, you're, uh, you, you play nice in the community, you know, in the SAP uh, ecosystem and other with other vendors too, but you're, you're very honest. So you have this uh, really interesting way of sort of walking that fine line between transparency and being honest and not sugarcoating stuff. But at the same time, you work really closely with the vendors and, um, you know, you've, you've seemed to have found a pretty good balance there to, to keep everyone happy. Sure yeah, and we've had this, we've had good discussions about that, and it is tricky, and we have lost partnerships and relationships over the years as a result of that. But it has always felt like it was important to stick to the principle of of being very keeping it real, um, mm-hmm. and and we really try to do that. But but that's kind of a longer discussion for another time. But yeah, that's yeah. our goal. Absolutely. Well, before we get into all this stuff, I want to get to around AI and innovation, grow and rise, and a lot of this stuff happening in the S4 HANA space right now. Um, maybe just, if you don't mind, just share with us, what, what do you, what's your knee-jerk reaction to the biggest successes and failures that SAP has had over the last, say, 30 years, or close to 30 years that you've been covering the space? Well, SAP is one of the most fascinating, frustrating, and <laughs> rewarding companies to cover in the entire enterprise space. Uh, it, it, it's almost impossible to unravel their contradictions. And it seems mm-hmm. like they'll do a lot of things right. And then they'll make some really questionable moves. And, and then you're like, how did this all happen? And then you look at like their stock price for this year, which is, it hit some all time highs. And if you look up a chart, it's like astronomical and there's all these strong buy ratings and we can get into why that is. Cause I think it has something to do with AI and how AI, right. where I is AI is trending. But yeah. um, but the point is that it's it's a fascinating company that, and I think it's got a pretty unique set of pros and cons. Um, it's it's clearly no longer just an ERP vendor, and SAP doesn't want to be perceived as a legacy transactional ERP vendor. That's both that's both a great thing for the company and a huge challenge for the company, and it makes it hard for people like you and me because after so many acquisitions and such a broad product footprint. It's very, very difficult for anyone to say they they can really be an expert on SAP. I mean, there's been news that has broken the last couple of weeks where it's like you get calls from reporters. You're like, wait, this just happened. So it things always move fast with SAP. And but in general, what what happened with this company obviously is they rose to prominence in in the in the mid '90s in a client server boom around business process reengineering. I, topic you remember mm-hmm. well yeah and uh, perhaps a precursor to today's transformation topics and that was sap erp and that was an erp system and then and then sap like basically it's not very sexy but sap just runs really well <laughs> and and it has this core sort of thing that it does really well the problem is that that becomes more and more of a back office commodity in today's market but it's still important Right. And and sometimes we underestimate the value of shit that just runs, right. and and SAP runs well, and and so that is something. But and that has bought them a lot of runway, because it is not easy to move out of that into something else, especially with all the industry depth and the customizations, which is a very double edged sword for a lot of customers now. But mm-hmm. so that that bought them a lot of time. But then of course, you could argue that SAP missed some really big things too, like like they missed that CRM surge completely, and that. And that was tough. They got some big competitors emerged, uh, including the sales forces of the world. And and I think in general, just this notion, the CR, early CRM, CRM vendors, some of them didn't even live to tell the day like Siebel. But the point is the customer became at the center of the enterprise conversation. And that has not changed. And SAP has clearly woken up to that by now. But they missed that one. I would argue they've missed a lot on SaaS and cloud stuff. And that's a long conversation. Um, and... In general, I think there was a uh, about what 15 years ago, 10, there w- there was a really big strategic bet made on Hana and in memory, which I think really interfered with focusing on building cloud-based business applications. And mm-hmm. I would argue that that was the wrong move that SAP should have stayed focused in business applications instead of trying to replatform everything on Hana. So that was a really complicated, problematic issue. But you know, now I think it's finally kind of moving past that one. And, and now what you have is you have also an SAP that's been strengthened by a lot of acquisitions, even though you can debate each one, but they weren't really great at building cloud products, but they acquired some pretty good ones. They were especially influenced by the success factors acquisition. And so now in the AI, in the AI era, you have a, a fairly young board that's not necessarily typified by a recognizable North American leader, but you still have Hasso Plotner founder lurking in the background, but now transitioning out of his roles and you have a leadership team that may not be perfect, but 
does listen to customers. And I think when you talk with them, they do understand where the enterprise is headed. It's just a matter of how do you create that customer first culture inside of a big organization like that. You have to be careful. And I've learned this lesson the hard way because over the past years, having great conversations with SAP leadership and be like, oh my God, they really get it. And then seeing some, a lot of disconnects, right? And then you see field sales, sales reps with quotas and quarterly numbers, and you can lose some of the good vibes. And then you right. find out thing, you know, more aggressive sales pitches and perhaps pushing things too aggressively. So it's a fascinating company, but I think it's a really important company right now because it has a global footprint. And right now, I don't want to sound too political, but we need globalist voices that are not divisive because so much of the culture around enterprise software is a disrupted global ecosystem of volatile supply chains, global conflict and strife, and very divisive political movements in various countries. And this, we might not want to talk about it, but it impacts business. So we have to talk about it. And I think SAP has the potential to be a very strong voice in that area. And I, and I like that about SAP. Yeah. Yeah. There's something to be said for the scale and the reach and the influence they have, you know, in a pretty short period of time too. I know you said you've been covering this space since 95 and I, I was getting into the space right around that time, right when SAP was sort of overtaking bond and becoming the, yep. you know, kind of the big ERP uh, system of choice. Um, w one quick thing I want to follow, uh, come back on is, you know, playing armchair quarterback here for a moment. Now that they have worked through or, or ha are working through some of the, that transition to the HANA platform and some of the distraction that that may have caused that you, you mentioned a moment ago, um, do you think it's paying dividends for them now? Do you think that you kind of now looking at the long game, looking where we are now and where we're headed, does that help them, particularly as we look at AI strategy and analytics and things like that? Does that real-time memory HANA database, does that is that a strength of theirs, do you think? Potentially. I mean, the, but the problem, though, is that with AI, the, the most powerful thing you could have for AI would be would be much more standard transactional systems that run in, in cloud-based environments. And SAP mm -hmm. has been very clear on that in my recent exclusive with, with Philip Herzig on there, who's their AI chief on, on their AI strategy. He was very clear that cloud-based systems are where the AI, the best AI comes from. And, right. and so I think I think you can really second guess. Now, here's the thing. SAP wasn't wrong that that for most transactional tasks in memory databases perform better than than relational databases for transactional ERP. They weren't wrong about that. But the question is, should they have been the ones to 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 really invest all that time and resource into being an innovator in that space? Because you don't get rewards for that. And most right. ERP systems now run on in-memory databases. Why would you want to become a database provider when you're a business applications builder and expert? I mean, so so at this point though, you kind of let it go and you say, well, that's what it is. <laughs> the, yeah. And, and, and one of the most baffling things you have to get used to around the enterprise software market is that there's a lot of forgiveness for, for missteps and, mm. and, and, and all vendors make them and they find a way to recoup. And you could argue some of that is because customers are locked in, but I would also say that SAP does have a lot of customer trust. And I think part of that goes back to the fact that while you know, customers can have their grievances with SAP. And there's been some big controversies over the year, like inter enterprise support a number of years ago. And there's an innovation strategy debate going on right now with user groups. But the thing is, when your stuff just runs and never breaks and is secure, that's a big deal. I mean, think about how you feel about cars, right? Like when you have that old reliable car that, that revs up every morning, even in cold weather, and then you have that fancier sports car, but it's always in the shop or it's right. too expensive. And you start to really appreciate that car that always runs. And, and I think that's a big part of how SAP accounts for the trust that they built up. And that has essentially accommodated a lot of margin for error. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like a, not a love hate relationship necessarily, but people can look past some of those weaknesses and it, you know, it's a big cumbersome product and that's a strength and a weakness, right? It, it can do yep. a lot of different things. It's, it's sophisticated. It's, robust. It's, it's, I, I don't want to use the word integrated because that's arguable, I suppose, but it, it, you know, it can, it can tie together a lot of different business functions for some of the largest enterprises in the world. So um, you're, you're going to get some dark side to that, to that model um, for yep. sure. I'm here with John Reed from Diginomica talking about AI and innovation in the S4 HANA space, what it means to the product and what it means to customers. We've got a lot more I want to get into, but first I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more of the journey to S4 HANA podcast. Mm -hmm. 
Are you looking for ways to promote your product or service to enterprise technology decision makers and influencers throughout the world, like the ones who listen to this podcast? Major Tom Productions creates media, events, and influencer marketing for B2B technology providers. Our productions are exciting, educational, disruptive, and effective. Most importantly, they create results. Our content is unlike any other in this industry, engaging, influential, and trusted by technology buyers and influencers throughout the world. Each month, our productions reach hundreds of thousands of targeted buyers and decision makers who trust and engage with our honest and tech agnostic content. With long tail viral results and engagement with our content, Major Tom Productions provides a way to reach your target market and create awareness, calls to action, and a connection with potential customers. So collaborate with us today. Learn how we can feature your product or service on podcasts such as Transformation Ground Control, Journey to S4 HANA, and Journey to Dynamics 365. We can also feature your brand on our YouTube channel called Digital Transformation with Eric Kimberling, which boasts over 100,000 subscribers and over 2 million video views per year. You can also participate in our in-person events, including our Digital Stratosphere Conference. Contact us today to learn more. We can tailor a marketing campaign that works for you. We look forward to helping more people learn more about and become engaged with your brand. The last thing you want to have happen is for your digital transformation to end up in court. I've been doing this for 20 years and I have seen everything. My name is Marcus Harris. I'm a software and technology attorney focusing my practice on drafting and negotiating software related contracts and litigating software disputes across the country. Feel free to reach out to us at taflaw.com. We'd love to talk to you about the litigation process and what you can expect. Welcome back to episode number five of the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. My name is Eric Kimberling, your host here today with Darian Fiakuski. I'm here with John Reed talking about AI and innovation in the S4 HANA space, as well as what it means to the product and customers of SAP. Let's jump back into the conversation. So let's dive into this AI uh, thread that you, you just started to touch on. You, you talked about this new chief AI officer that SAP just hired. In fact, you just wrote an article recently on the Diginomica website. And by the way, just for those that are listening to the audio uh, platform here, if you're not familiar with Diginomica, it's spelled D-I-G-I-N-O-M-I-C-A. So it almost it almost looks like Diginomica would be the the, the way you would you'd spell it. Um, just for those that haven't checked out, it's a really good website. You guys put out great stuff. It's very objective. It's balanced. Um, I like it a lot. I think that's a good, uh, it's a good source of truth that I go to for not just SAP stuff, but just ERP and digital transformation in general. But you wrote this article recently about the new chief AI officer. How would you, how would you summarize SAP's AI strategy in general? How are they doing? You know, how do they compare to their competitors? What's your takeaway from that? Okay, I will give you that. Just one thing I want to clarify quickly for listeners is that there's, there's a a number of different players in, in SAP, SAP's AI leadership, and that's partially because they also have built a, an ethics board around AI, which actually seems to have a little bit of teeth, um, which is mm -hmm. good. Um, it was in September that they announced Walter's son as new global head of artificial intelligence. I've heard from Walter in analyst briefings, have not directly interviewed him. The person that I interviewed is the global... AI chief officer, Philip Herzig, who reports directly to Christian Klein. One of the things SAP did this year is they did what they called an AI uh, powered reorg. Um, and that's, that's a longer discussion, but as part of that reorg, Philip Herzig now reports directly to Christian. So that gives some, and, and also there's been a, I think some talk of a billion dollar AI investment. So SAP is clearly investing heavily in this. Um, uh, one, one really big thing to understand about enterprise AI in general is that AI is very, very, very dependent on uh, for for quality output with generative AI. It's very, very dependent on quality data, right? And you have to have that in order to get a good result. 
And so that's one reason why vendors like SAP are feeling a little bit confident right now because they realize, oh my gosh, we're sitting on a lot of customer data here. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously you have to have integrity to privacy and security and all of that stuff. Um, but I think SAP generally gets good marks with that and it's based in the EU. So it's SAP's a lot more familiar with intense uh, privacy regulations than U.S. companies are in, in general. Um, and so, you know, that's why SAP this summer talked about, you know, 20,000 customers have, op you know, opted in to have their data be applied to these AI initiatives. Now, there's some questions about exactly how that all works. But the point is, they have the opt-ins, they have this buy-in, and that gives them some strength in the AI market because AI requires these, these deeper data sets in order to work effectively. So what SAP has done, and, and this is not a unique because its competitors are doing different versions of this, is every, what every vendor in the enterprise that has an investment in this is trying to do is get better result out of AI than you can get out of a chat GPT type of scenario. And so what, what you have to do there is, is manipulate the arch architecture somewhat to infuse um, more specific data for industry and customer, and then reduce the possibility of inaccurate or, or so-called hallucinatory output and mm -hmm. in these systems, because these systems are incredibly strong in terms of their versatility and their ability to engage users in, in compelling ways. But 100% but accuracy is not their strong suit and, in fact, is not achievable. So the question is, how do you get to a closer result? And SAP's architecture is designed to do that. And so the thing is that not every piece of that is in, is in place. So in, in the longer term, what SAP wants to have is they want to have um, – the, they want they'll be use these external large language models, but they will also – tune the results of these models in some different ways through their own foundational model, which will be informed by a knowledge graph, which will apply a lot of broader uh, con contextual information around industries, around SAP environments into the output, and then infuse that also with real-time customer data via the HANA vector engine. So that is sort of the architecture in place that they want to have in the future but they're still building towards some of those pieces. The foundational model, for example, has not been released yet. The knowledge graph is still under development, but the HANA vector engine is being used and it's essentially kind of a, it's it's similar to the RAG type of technique of, it's called retrieval augmented generation that you can look up online. But this is a an important technique for improving the output of LLM results. Because remember in an LLM context, you have a strength of the massive data set but it's trained at a certain point in time. So when, when GPT got tied to Bing search, this type of RAG method is the way to get currency into the results and more accuracy into the results. Hmm. So anyway, the, the first example of that came out in the, in the fourth quarter with success factors where there's uh, the SAP Jewel, uh, uh, they call it a co-pilot. I don't like that co-pilot term, but a lot of vendors use it. Um, I think that's a little little over optimistic as far as the current abilities, but if you, you fuse the data in there, and and so it's all the help.sap.com documentation built into a success factors digital assistant that allows you to ask information as you're going through your workday, and and get information and results in in real time, and and this is much stronger than a traditional FAQ search because it's just more contextual to a individual's needs and. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, it's, this is early release, so I've yet to talk with a customer to validate some of this. But I have talked to other customers in other software scenarios around this, and they've gotten some pretty good results. Hmm. What about – so you talk about uh, success factors and in, in the use of AI within that. How, how would you assess – SAP's AI strategy across the different platforms. Not, so mm -hmm. S4 HANA, Success Factors, Ariba, Concur, are they applying that sort of evenly across the entire SAP ecosystem of, of products or is it stronger in certain areas or certain applications? Yeah, they are they are applying it across the board. Now there are there there is a little bit of a catch here and some debate that's going on between user groups and SAP in terms of how uh, easy and realistic is, is it to make make that all that innovation accessible to customers on older releases, for example, ECC releases. I'm of the mindset that you you want to make all that information as possible available through the business technology platform, which is the perfect platform to deliver cloud-based services. You could argue AI is that. But SAP has to be a little careful because some of these Gen AI services are pretty expensive. And 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 if if customers have to shoehorn too much proprietary data to use these systems, then you lose your value value proposition. And that's one of the main reasons why SAP focuses on 
these standardized cloud environments, which if you read my interview, you can get some quotes from Herzig on this and why this is important to SAP. But that mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're not going to make it available across the board. It's just that the first um, software applications they tend to look at for, for the new Gen AI scenarios around things like Joule and digital assistance and stuff like that are the cloud-based products. But remember that that AI is much more than than just just cloud-based um you know uh generative ai stuff um in fact like you know hers gave me a bunch of different stats as far as they have 155 ai scenarios in use by 24,000 customers with roadmap of 150 more use cases this year and that's a mix of more what you might call traditional ai a lot of that is is deep learning and predictive and pattern recognition stuff in various capacities but all that stuff has been Im embedded already in you know at least newer versions of of erp and newer versions of various products so sap wants us to impact the entire modern product line of all of their software because you know basically you know what they want to do is make it easier for for users to do their their jobs i mean this is basically like a process of of you know you whether it's truly intelligent or not we could debate but the idea is that you know, simplify your workload, make you smarter, get more out of your talent by automating as much as possible and, you know, and adapting more intelligently to real time conditions, identify anomalies, surface patterns, surface opportunities. And this goes across the entire product it's where some of the questions come in that customers have to ask is, how does this fit into my footprint? And I can't possibly answer that in today's podcast because every customer is a little bit different. And like I said, there's going to be more serious questions about that when it goes to older releases because SAP has said at times in the last six months that you have to be a Rise customer and Grow is considered the same in that capacity. Rise or Grow to access AI innovations and there's been a lot of pushback from user groups and also from me personally and some yeah. of my call and some of my colleagues on that because we don't happen to think that's the best way to deliver those services. I'm here with John Reed from Diginomica talking about AI and innovation in the S4 HANA space, what it means to the product and what it means to customers. We've got a lot more I want to get into, but first I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more of the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, and I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting Group. And I wanted to take a moment and tell you a little bit about Third Stage and what we do and how we help clients through their S4 HANA implementations. First of all, third stage is technology agnostic, meaning that we're not affiliated with SAP. However, we do have quite a bit of experience helping clients through their S4 HANA implementations. We help clients evaluate and do a fit gap analysis of S4 HANA. We help them find the right system integrator. We help them negotiate their contracts with SAP and their system integrator. And then we also help with implementation planning and the implementation itself. So we help mobilize the right resources, make sure you've got a solid and realistic program to manage overall S4 HANA implementation. And then we'll help with the program management, the change management, as well as process improvement. We also provide some technical services around data migration, as well as architecture and system integration as well. So those are just some of the things we can do to help you through your transformation. And if you're looking for more information about it, or if you'd like to learn more, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to just bounce around ideas or be an informal sounding board for you as you begin your transformation. You can reach me by contacting me via the contact information in the links below in the description field for this podcast. So look forward to chatting with you and we'll see you soon. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Welcome back to episode number five of the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. My name is Eric Kimberling, your host here today with Darian Fiakuski. I'm here with John Reed talking about AI and innovation in the S4 HANA space, as well as what it means to the product and customers of SAP. 
let's jump back into the conversation. You have a lot of SAP customers that are deploying S4 HANA and they're, I don't want to say they're resistant, but it just, for whatever reason, they haven't made a big subset of their customer base move on to public cloud. It's been mostly um, private cloud, in some cases, even on-prem uh, for a lot of, at least the, the customers we're seeing. So how does AI fit into that, to that, that uh, thread? So in other words, you've got customers, some customers on S4 HANA on-prem, some, a lot of them on uh, private cloud, some on public cloud. Is AI, like how does AI fit into that? Right. Are, you, are you kind of left out in the cold? If, if you're on-prem or private cloud, do you have to be public cloud to get the full capability um, here? Well, I think you will need to be on the most recent SAP releases and whether or not you have to be a rise or grow customer is under some debate right now. A lot of us are pushing SAP, like I said, to do this through BTP is the official sort of contractual license format. But um, ultimately, it's got less to do. The good news is it's got less to do with cloud. The bad news is it's got to do with how clean and standardized your data structures are because okay. that's how AI plugs into that. Right. Now there's different kinds of AI, which is important to keep in mind because SAP is embedding AI into its software, but customers can also look at specific AI based initiatives that they could collaborate on with SAP or other vendors. So for example, like if, if you're a customer, if you have a strong data science team, you can look at open source AI scenarios and you can work on projects right now, either with SAP or other vendors outside of that footprint, perhaps. Um, but again, you're really going to need quality data. And, and for example, you could have, it's less about cloud and more about the quality of your data. So like if you, if you yeah. like, for example, I did a case study on a customer that had really high quality data, really good documentation around their service procedures and stuff. And so they were able to do a very controlled customer faces facing service bot in a regulated industry, in their case, financial services that really served up customers really pretty much good information for the most part and alleviated a lot of their email support. But that was because they had quality data in a very specific area. They couldn't mm -hmm. necessarily expand that quickly to other parts of their company, but it did give them a leg up. So the way to think about it is that if you do have some quality data, then you can get started, even if you're not necessarily in the cloud fully. And so that's the good news. There are options, but you will have to look at data governance and data quality. And the best thing to do, because these data initiatives, as you know, can be overwhelming multi-year affairs, is to focus on an area where you have high data quality and where you think you could get some impact. And, and you can bet that SAP will have a desire to try to help you with that, whether it's a standard policy they have. If you talk to your account rep, I'm sure they'll be happy to talk with you as one of the options for you to explore in that area. But this is why SAP is really pushing the clean core, by the way, Eric, because the idea would be that you might move into the private cloud S4 because you know you have the CCC maintenance deadline coming up. But over time, the idea is that you would make a gradual move to standard. And as part of that, your data quality is going to improve. So it's not that SAP won't do one-off AI. They will, I think, very much so. But SAP is also thinking about impact, right? So you, if you think, I want to serve a bunch of customers with the same AI functionality, then I'm obviously going to start with a cloud-based product like success right. factors and do something like job descriptions that a whole bunch of customers that can consume rather than working individually with one S4 HANA customer on one area where they have good quality data, right? So that's why yeah. SAP is prioritizing and emphasizing the cloud. But I would agree with you that I think you can do very effective AI without being in the cloud, as long as you have quality data and a good data governance strategy, and perhaps in some cases, a data science team to support you internally. Yeah. How how realistic is this AI stuff in the SAP world right now? As far as, I know it exists, it's there, but I mean, as far as customers, SAP customers effectively using it, you, you mentioned a use uh, case or a case study that you you recently covered, but just in general, are you seeing pretty wide set adopt widespread adoption from customers? Are they taking more of a wait and see attitude? Are they confused by it? Just trying to you know kind of waiting for it to happen? Or how how would you assess the SAP customers' view and use of AI? Yeah, I mean, I think I think when customers find AI services built into their products, they're generally pretty favorable about that. I mean. In many ways, you could kind of just think about this as progressions in automation, that automation gets better and smarter. 
and you get more decision-making tools that are more proactive. So another way of thinking about AI stuff is that instead of checking dashboards all the time to see how you're doing and remembering to check, maybe you're starting to get more event-driven alerts right in real time. Mm -hmm. And because so much of what we want to do in global business is about making more real-time adjustments, right? Whether it's an unhappy customer or a, a, a shipment lot, you know, set, uh, trapped on some dock somewhere that can't get where it needs some port that's been closed down. Or you, you want to get alerted to this stuff ahead of time and around things like maintenance, for example. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if you started getting pings? Hey, this machine, this, this really expensive machine in this factory is going to break in the next month instead of like, oh, it broke. Now we're screwed for a while, right? right. And so customers are going to welcome that, but they're not necessarily going to say, oh, give me some AI. They're just going to welcome it embedded in their software. Now, in some cases, SAP has indicated that there will be charging some premiums for AI. And that was one of the things that set users off this summer was when CEO Kristen Klein talked about, you know, 30% AI premiums, which Wall Street, of course, loved. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but I don't think they will charge a premium for all of it. Some of it's going to be embedded and some of it is more expensive to run than others. But in general, that is a little bit of a tricky trade-off with AI is that, the AI that's having impact, whether you call it traditional or gen AI, it's all deep learning based stuff that requires massive data sets for training. These are not cheap systems. And so the pricing is going to have to take a close look because as you've written about a lot in your blog, which I think is one reason why I love reading your blog, you look a lot at, hey, well, what kind of success did we actually achieve here? And yeah. the financial investment is going to be part, part of that math. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes total sense. Now, now you talked too about um, uh, rise and grow and how rise and grow customers, it, it may be, the situation may be that rise and grow customers are the ones that are, are going to benefit from AI. Um, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, we've talked about this in other episodes too. You know, the rise program is basically SAP's um, systematic or, or uh, process of trying to get legacy SAP customers onto S4HANA and then the grow initiative is really their mid-market initiative to try and get more people to um, to make it more enticing to the mid-market to, to chew off or to bite off on a uh, S4 HANA implementation. But what, how do you see the grow and rise initiatives fitting into the, the SAP um, ecosystem? Is, is this a good idea? Do you think it's helping? What, what's your assessment of grow and rise in general? Well, I think the programs are still maturing, but I think of them at their core as hyperscaler management programs because they're designed at their core to help SAP customers manage complex cloud environments that they really may not want to turn over to the hyperscalers who don't really understand SAP and SAP's approach to innovation and stuff like that. And I give SAP credit. They've trotted out a bunch of rising grow customers for me over the last couple of years. And I've been able mm -hmm. to talk with them and, you know, learn what the, the value they see. So I see a place for it. The problem that I have seen with it is the overemphasis of it, like as the way forward, because I think that custom, I'm a huge believer in customer choice. And if a customer wants to manage their own hyperscaler relationships, then I believe that they should be able to do that without losing access to so-called innovation. Now, mm. so the, the big question all the user groups have been asking is, is there a technical reason why I have to do that? Because technical dependencies do exist. For example, with like um, SAP is working on this um, green ledger concept, which have some technical dependencies, like you have to be on a certain S4 HANA release in order to for it, for it to work properly, as, as I've been told in the past. We'll see if that changes. Those things customers are used to because there's a clear technical relationship and it happens sometimes. You try to avoid it because in general, the proper approach I believe for vendors right now is to give all your customers, no matter what l version of legacy they're on, the opportunity to consume innovation via cloud services without upgrading. I call it upgrading in place. And that's what needs to happen. And I will point out that some of SAP's biggest competitors are having a field day with that strategy. Um, mm. So it, this is not something I'm making up. Um, right. I'm not going to name those competitors now, but you can use your imagination. Um, so, so the point is, it's established, and I think SAP needs to move more in that direction rather than say, 
you need to be in these programs because a lot of these programs still need to get sorted a little bit because they're complicated. Like, okay, in a rise context, who handles patches, who handles this, who handles that? You got to sort that out. It takes time to understand the value, but I think it can be very valuable for certain customers that I've talked with. But I think as a delivery path for innovation, it's a little bit questionable. And SAP has offered up some reasons why you, you need to do it, but nothing that really passed muster for me as far as a, a deal breaker that you can offer through a BTP platform, which is the way I think you should do it because right. that's the cloud services delivery platform. But like, so I think there's a huge, huge distinction between SAP saying you have to do rise and grow to, to innovate versus this is the best way to innovate in the cloud, you know? Mm. And, and there's a huge distinction between saying this is the best way Versus, you know, it's the only way. And so I think right. SAP's got to be really careful. But they are walking back some of that language now. And I sense a different tone than than this summer and early fall. And the user group messaging is a little less strident this time around. Uh, D DSAG and UKI sub just issued their positions on the latest because Rise just offered some more incentives for customers. I think overall it's good. SAP wants to help its customers modernize. But I would argue that a lot of customers still need help with things around S4 HANA migration, business case, and all this stuff. And you don't want customers who are taking on these serious investments to wonder if they're going to get access to innovation on those platforms. SAP should be able to say, yeah, if you're an S4 HANA customer, you'll have access to everything you need. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes in uh, different uh, shades of innovation, I suppose. Like you said, if you're in the cloud, there's more, there's just more to work with. There's more um, robust capabilities available. If you're not in the cloud, you still get innovation. There's still advantages, uh, maybe just not as much as if you're you're in the cloud. Um, exactly. And like I said, it really comes down more to the to your data governance and the standardization on that than anything else. But but I do think it's important to listen to SAP when they say why certain services are only are only or best consumed in a SaaS or cloud environment because they're not they're not just talking like out of thin air about that. That's real. But I think that should be limited as much as possible because this is all about adoption and making customers happy. And the whole thing is the happier your customers are with you, the, guess what? The more software they're going to buy, the more business they're going to want to do with you. And then they start treating you like a true transformation partner and not an ERP back office partner. And ultimately that's what SAP is going for. They want to be perceived as a true transformation partner. Yeah. Although I would say if they really want to do that, they should probably ease up on this, uh, you know, forced migration thing with the, the 2027 deadline for legacy customers moving off ECC and R3. And yet, I think there are ways of finding really good ways of helping support customers through that. Even if you're going to stick with that, I think in general, like you could, you could find all kinds of ways of discounting various services, making life better for customers who are struggling um, but, but yeah, I would agree with you that like in the ideal world, you wouldn't have any deadline at all and it would all be customer choice to move. But, yeah. you know, exactly, you know, what I don't know and I haven't had a chance to really get into with SAP is like, were there ways around that circumstance they found themselves in? But, yeah. and, and that I don't know, but I, but I do know there are, there are some consequences that, and, and, and I will say that the you know, the communication on that has been clear. So like user groups understand this, but one of the big dangers for customers is that they would then as a response to that do strictly a technical migration, you know, and yeah. um, this is the kind of thing that really gets you into trouble because now like trying to go back, I mean, now we're in your wheelhouse, Eric, but doing a technical upgrade and then trying to go back later and apply a transformation mentality to that, yeah. 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 I yeah, think I mean, you probably, I think you probably written a hundred blog posts about why that's a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. What well, the last thing you want to do is go back and take all that customization you did in our ECC and R3 and try to recreate yeah. that in S4 HANA and overcomplicate things and then forget AI. Cause you're not, you're not getting there. You're, you're just going to struggle enough just yep. to get the basic functionality in place. I'm here with John Reed from Diginomica talking about AI and innovation in the S4 HANA space, what it means to the product and what it means to customers We've got a lot more I want to get into, but first I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more of the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. If you're going through an S4 HANA implementation, you're looking for best practices and tips on how to make your project more successful, I encourage you to check out two resources that I made available to our listeners here on this podcast. First is our guide to a successful S4 HANA implementation. 
It's a paper that I wrote based on all of our clients that have implemented S4HANA, some of the lessons we've learned, some of the best practices that we typically advise our clients to follow when going through their S4HANA implementation. So be sure to check that out. You can find that in the links below in this podcast. You can also scan the QR code right in front of you. The second thing you might want to check out is an online course that I've created. It's a course that's called the Deep Dive into SAP S4HANA Implementations. And in that two and a half hour course, I get into all the basics of what SAP S4HANA is, what it takes to make the project more successful, how to manage change, how to handle the project planning, how to manage your system integrator, as well as some case studies from some of our clients and some of the lessons learned from some of our clients. So check out that training as well. So there's two things you can check out here, both in the links below. One is the guide to S4HANA implementations. The other is my S4HANA training course. So be sure to check it out. And our goal here is to help you be more successful in your transformation. So hope you found this information useful and uh, we'll continue on with the show. Are you looking for ways to promote your product or service to enterprise technology decision makers and influencers throughout the world, like the ones who listen to this podcast? Major Tom Productions creates media, events, and influencer marketing for B2B technology providers. Our productions are exciting, educational, disruptive, and effective. Most importantly, they create results. Our content is unlike any other in this industry, engaging, influential, and trusted by technology buyers and influencers throughout the world. Each month, our productions reach hundreds of thousands of targeted buyers and decision makers who trust and engage with our honest and tech agnostic content. With long tail viral results and engagement with our content, Major Tom Productions provides a way to reach your target market and create awareness, calls to action, and a connection with potential customers. So collaborate with us today. Learn how we can feature your product or service on podcasts such as Transformation Ground Control, Journey to S4 HANA, and Journey to Dynamics 365. We can also feature your brand on our YouTube channel called Digital Transformation with Eric Kimberling, which boasts over 100,000 subscribers and over 2 million video views per year. You can also participate in our in-person events, including our Digital Stratosphere Conference. Contact us today to learn more. We can tailor a marketing campaign that works for you. We look forward to helping more people learn more about and become engaged with your brand. Welcome back to episode number five of the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. My name is Eric Kimberling, your host here today with Darian Fiakuski. I'm here with John Reed talking about AI and innovation in the S4 HANA space, as well as what it means to the product and customers of SAP. Let's jump back into the conversation. You know, you, you, back to your earlier point about SAP has built up a certain amount of goodwill and credibility in the space, but I also think in the last couple of years with this 27 deadline, for existing SAP customers, I think they've taken a, some pretty big withdrawals from that from that goodwill. There's a, there's some distrust I, you, you kind of sense seeping in the marketplace, at least from from our perspective as a, as consultants. Um, oh yeah, for sure. And I think also like like there's this thing around like 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 you can communicate that message clearly, but there's still something around like the like feeling that forced march no one likes that feeling so yeah. sap's got some goodwill to make up there and and hopefully they can get on top of that because what i was going to say about it is when you look at the stats most customers are planning to move or are planning their moves like more than i was actually expecting but you know there there's still a percentage that are in that zone where they say they're moving but it's hard to really know what to do with that data exactly yeah, and so SAP really, really needs to to bear down on, on that, and really make it as easy as possible. Because like, you know, it, I just did this Windows 10 upgrade to to my last Windows 7 machine, and that had to go in the shop, man. And when it came back, it wasn't the same, and that's yeah. that really, really harshed my buzz with Microsoft, right? But yeah. but if I had been able to just press a button at home, and not take it into the shop. I think it wouldn't have deteriorated my goodwill to the same extent. So I think SAP has an opportunity to make that a little better, but you're right. It, it is a sticking point and they're going to have to make up for it. 
and they've got the products to do it. I mean, they've got the history, the products. I mean, it's it, they've got a good suite of products. I mean, I, I know I've been harsh at times on SAP and general strategy. I know you you know you, you've also called out the strengths and the weaknesses as we talked about earlier here today. Um, but they, they've got a great suite of products. I mean, I think it's just a matter of how you get customers to optimize it and be successful in the deployments. I think that's the million dollar question that we're all trying to help help our customers yeah. and audience members solve here. On the plus side, it's going to keep your team busy for the next few years. Yeah. Yeah. We do see a window of, uh, you know, troubled and challenged S4 on implementations or just greenfield implementations yeah. that need help and whatnot. Um, and, and also, um, you know, I know we've talked a lot about AI grow and rise. We've talked about a little bit about the innovation strategy at SAP. Um, just to shift gears a little bit though, and, and continue with that thread of kind of what's new, what's developing with SAP, what should SAP customers expect, expect as they're going through their S4 HANA implementations or even after they're, they're live on it. Uh, we've got this, uh, SAP has its Sapphire conference coming up in June. Um, what are, what should, what else should customers expect that we haven't already talked about? What are some of the trends or ex, um, expected announcements or developments in the space that you would anticipate talking about it at Sapphire in June? Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna. It's always going to be interesting to to connect SAP's marketing and messaging priorities with with customers. And you know, ASUG ASUG will also do their annual conference co location this year at the same event. And so we looked at ASUG a little bit. I remember last year talking to executives. Um, my fellow analyst uh, Josh Greenbaum and I we did a sort of open discussion session, and it was amazing how the executives kept bringing it around to S four Hana, looking to skills questions looking at business case questions change adoption change you, once again your wheelhouse change management exactly. all that You're stuff my coming, language. <laughs> all that stuff coming up like front and center but but customers are also interested in the bigger picture and they do want to feel like they are they have an innovation partner with sap and so they are going to be interested to hear about the ai stuff because the thing about the ai stuff is that it's it's not just oh help me do my job better there is unique pressures around adoption where you don't want rogue, rogue usage by employees use freelancing on these systems with your company IP and your board probably feels pressure to say what they're doing around it. And so, you you know, your CXO types need to have answers. And so some of Sapphire is about looking for those answers. There's also, I think, a pretty notable kind of couple things to watch as far as SAP's major restructuring that they announced AI driven 8,000 mm -hmm. employees affected they say no layoffs, it's going to be voluntary and there's going to be a big transition. But a lot of it, they also mentioned reskilling and I'm going to pursue it this with SAP a little bit because I think this reskilling is really powerful also for customers. Like, how do I need to reskill and prepare for what's next? And, and obviously, like data, data governance is front and center in a lot of that. But what are the skills I'm going to need internally? Do I need a, a better data science team? Can I get by without that? Because a lot of my discussion with Herzig was about how for a lot of customers, maybe prompt engineering is going to do the trick with Gen AI and you're not going to need a, a you know, complex data science like scenario internally to be able to consume that. So, you know, customers are going to need to learn about all that stuff. And I think we'll he hopefully hear a fair amount about that Sapphire and then a big change with the supervisory board, you know, that Hasso Plotner uh, has been, you know, formally been planning to move on. And then they had, um, uh, Dr. Puneet uh, Renjen was was planning to take over, and I was actually a little bit nervous about that because he was he had so much background with Deloitte, and we haven't gotten into this, but partners are a big part of the equation with successful SAP projects, and I'm just really not infatuated with the big SAP partners for the most part. Though any size partner can can screw up a project, but right. I, I tend to be much more a fan of like SWAT teams of industry experts going in and, and really kicking butt versus bigger. And, and look, I mean, uh, I don't think, I think it's pretty fair to say that Deloitte has showed up in SAP project failure stories about as often as any other vendor. I mean, there, you know, everyone gets their turn at that. Um, right. So I wasn't really real comfortable because I, I feel like these big consultancies have to go through a big business transformation going forward. And I wasn't really comfortable that the, of, with that appointment, but this new supervisory board member that is, now been nominated and I, I would really screw up his name, but it's um uh Pekka Ala Pietella. I hope I got that kind of right. Um he served on the supervisory board before and also Nokia, but he's got a lot of ex depth of experience in AI as well and in AI like governance and AI planning and stuff. And so I'm kind of a little more enthusiastic about that because that's really important for SAP's 
direction. I mean, ordinarily, we don't think a lot about supervisory board stuff, but Hasso Plotner is such an important player in all of this that his transition to even more of a backseat role is is kind of something to keep an eye on. Mm. And and just in general, I think it's interesting to look to North American leadership for SAP and who the who the identifiable face of SAP in North America is. And that'll be interesting to see who they put up on stage and emphasize this year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Super interesting. A lot to look forward to in, in yeah. uh, at Sapphire and in, in, in the SAP world in general. Um, with all these changes and all the activity in the SAP space, just to sort of bring this all full mm. circle and, and put a bow on it as a, as a closing question here, what are, what are some of the biggest or most important recommendations you would give to customers that are either in the process of or about to start their S4 HANA implementation? Well, I think we can start with sort of choosing the right partner. And, mm. you know, I think the partner has to has to really line up well with with a few different things with your overall. Tr I think you need an overall transformation strategy in your industry that your partner agrees upon. I think you need to have some kind of stance on clean core and cloud. And and to to our discussion, you don't necessarily have to be a cloud first company in some industries. That's not even realistic. Um, uh, but you do need to be thinking about the impact of, of you know, uh, analytics. Uh, these are not just transactional systems anymore. You need to be thinking about your data platform. And then, you know, I think you want a partner that can help you figure out how your SAP footprint matches up with best of breed components you might want to integrate and how interoperable all of that is going to be. Yeah. And someone who can give you some tough love and push back a little bit too and not just do everything you want, but tell you why other companies in your industry have done it differently and why. And I think having the confidence there and then also the skills development plan is crucial because you really need to figure out which skills you want to cultivate internally and which ones you're going to pull in from, you know, an external provider. And, and I'm just a, such a strong believer in the center of excellence concept of, you know, if you have a SAP footprint of, of significant size that you have that internal center of excellence and you are cultivating that internal leadership as well. And the final thing I would say is some kind of independent uh, auditors of various kinds. I know, mm. I know you do that type of stuff. There's other companies that do, but I do think that it's so important to have an independent voice involved in these projects that can help um, figure out how are we going to measure success and how are we going to intervene at different points? How are we going to track the metrics we all agree upon and make sure we are on track? Because when you look at the the implementations that go awry, so many of these are just went too far down the road before someone came up for air and said, Hey, I think this might, something might be going awry here. You're yeah. really, what you're aiming for is more that Apple watch vibe of like, how's my health today? How's my blood? You, you need some kind of project health monitor. And if it's not 24 seven, it's gotta be at least, you know, weekly, if not, you know, monthly, if not weekly. And then if you have all that in place and you know, I think you want to be able to say, how does this S4 HANA project? How, how will the, how will we get results along the way? Because you can't just have multi-year products anymore. You need to, how are we going to have milestones that build success and momentum? So when our board asks us how we're doing, we can show them some quick wins. And there's different ways of doing that. We could talk about some of those at another podcast, maybe things like central finance or establishing some cloud services along the way that, are, that support the S4. But how are we going to do the, the quick wins? And then ultimately, how is this system going to help us serve our externals better, our customers better, our suppliers better, all of our stakeholder groups better than in the past? Because that's the biggest weakness in historical ERP is not on premise. The historical weakness is the inward facing transactional focus in an era where we need to be externally facing, always adapting and, and always getting good analytical insight into what's happening. So that's what you want out of your S4. If yeah. you can get anywhere near that, you've had a success and you won't wind up in Eric's blog. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or hiring me to be an expert witness yeah. in a lawsuit for <laughs> helping you do it right, right the first time. It's a lot cheaper to hire us. Yeah. To Come right on. Don't, let's, let's put Eric out of the er expert wit witness business and put him yes. into the helping people business, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. It'll so. be a lot less heartache in the, in the industry for sure. Uh, well, John, that was, a, that was an awesome place to leave it. And I appreciate you being here today. It's always, it's always sure. fun talking to you and, uh, I hope you'll be back on this podcast again soon because we've got a lot more we didn't oh, yeah. get to that I'd love to get to next time. Yeah, man. We always seem to have these these excellent talks. So I, I love that exchange of ideas with you. It's always rewarding. So thanks.
a lot of good stuff we covered there. A lot of stuff I didn't know about behind the scenes, inner workings of SAP as an organization, as well as what they're doing from an AI and innovation perspective. So that's really interesting to kind of think how that might affect S4 HANA as a product and S4 HANA customers in the future. So uh, we're going to debrief and go into some more detail on a few of those threads that we talked about. First, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. I recently published my first book. It's called The Final Countdown, Strategies to Reach the Third Stage of Digital Transformation. And I wrote this book because I really wanted to find a concise way to share some of my knowledge around digital strategy and how to get started on a digital transformation journey. So in this book, I cover three different sections. I cover the people, process, and technology aspects of transformation with the idea that it's meant to be a starting point, a launching pad for organizations and team members that are going through digital transformations. So I encourage you to buy this book. You can get it electronically, you can get it uh, paperback, or you can get it in hard copy as I'm holding here in front of you. You can get it by going to thefinalcountdown.com. You can also search for it on Amazon if you shop at Amazon. Otherwise, just go to thefinalcountdown.com. Love to hear your feedback uh, on this book as well. So I hope you check it out and hope you enjoy. The last thing you want to have happen is for your digital transformation to end up in court. I've been doing this for 20 years and I have seen everything. My name is Marcus Harris. I'm a software and technology attorney focusing my practice on drafting and negotiating software-related contracts and litigating software disputes across the country. Feel free to reach out to us at taflaw.com. We'd love to talk to you about the litigation process and what you can expect. Welcome back to episode number five of the Journey to S4 HANA podcast. My name is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting, an independent consulting firm that helps clients with S4 HANA implementations. You can uh, find new episodes of this show and past episodes of the show by going to journey to s 4 hanacom And uh, you can learn about sponsorship opportunities by reaching out to Mindy at Major Tom Productions. I've included her contact information below. Major Tom Productions is the uh, company that produces this podcast. And when I say you can find her contact information below, I mean in the description field below for this podcast episode. So be sure to check that out. Um, so Darian, we had John on the show. He's always a great guest. He's always entertaining, knowledgeable, uh, humorous. There's a lot that goes along with with John Reed, and I, that's why I like the guy so much. But what were some of your thoughts and questions and takeaways from that conversation? Yeah, I just loved listening to him talk about the different things that SAP is doing with AI that I definitely didn't know about and all the innovation that goes with that, like you said. Um, and I think that is a really interesting topic and I would love to obviously learn more about it even further after this conversation. So it was really fun to hear. Um, one question I have from the conversation though is what are the challenges that SAP faces in effectively integrating AI into its existing products and services further like than what they've already done? I think probably the biggest thing is is data. You know, data is a key to good AI or to getting the most value out of AI. So there's two threads here, two prongs to it. One is the customer's data and legacy data that you need to bring over to S4 HANA to then apply to, to use these AI uh, algorithms for whatever function or capability you're trying to, to do. Um, and that's not always an easy proposition. It's usually harder than organizations think to clean up the data, to map it to the new system, to put in the governance, to make sure that you keep the data clean and that you've got some structure and consistency around the data. So that's that's one thing. The second thing that I think is a challenge, but, but maybe more of an opportunity for SAP customers and AI in general, is the more customers that bring their data into the SAP cloud, uh, that's more data that SAP has access to and that the algorithm and the AI can take advantage of. So it's, it's just gonna become, the AI models will become smarter, they'll scale faster, they'll become more accurate, more beneficial, more valuable to organizations as they, um, as they leverage the data sets from the many clients that are hosting S4 HANA and their data in the cloud. Now, of course, SAP has to get permission from customers to do that, but you know, I, I think there's a number that tens of thousands of them have already agreed to allow SAP to access that data, to use it in their, their AI. So I think those are the two keys there. It's, it's, it, it really all comes back to data in my, my opinion. Of course, I guess maybe a third that we can't overlook is just the human impact and the fear and the resistance that might come along with the concept or the, the thought behind AI. But, um, you know, that's a change management issue that that's not a small deal, but it's something that 
um, isn't really related to the technology, it's more related to the human dynamic, which is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the audience, you guys will probably have some great comments or questions from today's conversation to even further this conversation. But I thought overall, it was really insightful. And I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I did too. I thought he, he's, he did a great job of sort of explaining what's going on and what to expect in the future with AI and innovation. Like you said, Darian, I'm curious to hear from the audience. What do you think? What do you think about it? SAP's AI strategy? If you're using AI, you know, what do you think of it? What do you think of SAP's innovation? Love to hear your feedback, whether you're a customer or a consultant or an analyst or whatever, uh, whoever you are, I'd love to hear your feedback uh, in the comments field. So be sure to drop those in the chat and uh, we'll keep an eye on those as well. So I want to thank, uh, thank you for being here again this week, Darian. Thank you to John for being here. Thank you to the audience for the great questions that uh, we were able to incorporate into the show. Um, you can find new episodes every week. So we'll have another episode drop next week. Uh, a lot of good stuff we're going to cover throughout the rest of the season related to change management and case studies and other trends in the S4 HANA space. We'll have more customers of ours. We'll have more uh, consultants, more SAP experts on the show to talk about uh, some of the lessons and things you need to know about S4 HANA implementations. You can find uh, past episodes and future episodes of this show by going to journey to S4 HANA.com. And uh, the show is sponsored by Third Stage Consulting, an independent consulting for firm that helps clients with S4HANA implementations, among other things. You can learn more about us at thirdstage-consulting.com. The show is produced by Major Tom Productions. You can uh, learn about how to advertise your brand in front of this audience or other audiences for some of our sister podcasts for Major Tom Productions. Uh, you can reach out to Mindy on our team, on the Major Tom team, and I've included Mindy's contact information in the info description field below, so be sure to check that out. Hope you all have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you, seeing you next week on the next episode of the Journey to S4HANA podcast. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.